Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. To all who shall see these presents, greetings. On behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Nate Janikin, Operations Officer here at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the United States government. We will also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community of interest who could not join us today. So we ask that you keep your own webcams off to help us stream smoothly. At the conclusion of our discussion, we'll have a question and answer session. So if you have a question, just type it in the group chat and we'll go through them in the order received. So with recent activities of Wagner Group in Ukraine, as well as Blackwater Security Company, Iraq and Afghanistan, many of us are familiar or at least cognizant of the existence of private security companies. Not only that, but mercenaries are rife through history, as well as we see plenty of examples throughout Hollywood. Uh, but the same idea afloat seems less popular, maybe. Uh, Blackwater did attempt to offer maritime protection in the Red Sea, but were unsuccessful in finding customers. And in the NGO realm, listeners may be more familiar with the Sea Shepherd organization, likely from the Animal Planet series uh, Whale Wars, that featured the group from 2007 to 2016. Uh, a few weeks ago, we talked with Preston McLaughlin about irregular warfare during great power competition. And in our last episode, we spoke with Drake Long about seabed disputes. So in that short vein, today we're going to be talking about maritime security companies and maritime NGOs. So with us today is Dr. Claude Barabee. He's a, the director of the Naval Academy Museum in Annapolis, as well as an associate professor of history there. Uh, Dr. Barabee was an intelligence officer in the United States Reserves and retired as a commander. He did active duty tours in Europe, Guantanamo Bay, and the Persian Gulf in 2004-2005 with ESG-5. He earned his doctorate from the University of Leeds and wrote his dissertation on the U.S. Navy during Andrew Jackson's presidency. He was a 2004 Brookings Institution Legis Fellow, a 2010 Maritime Security Studies Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, as well as the 2018 recipient of the Alfred Thayer Mahan Award for Literary Achievement from the Naval League. He's a contributing editor at War on the Rocks, host of the Preble Hall podcast from the Naval Chem Museum, and is an author of a great many fiction and nonfiction books. So, uh, Dr. Barabee, thank you very much uh, for joining us today, especially a little bit on short notice. Uh, so we appreciate that. Uh, and I'll you know, send it over to you for some uh, for your opening comments. Well, thank you very much, Major. I appreciate your invitation and always enjoy uh, talking to you folks. Uh, one of the great pleasures uh, that I've had in my career teaching most of the past 18 years, the United States Naval Academy has been teaching our future Navy and Marine Corps leaders. Uh, and I want to extend a, a, I don't know if Colonel Barrick is online, uh, but I'd like to extend my personal appreciation and thank you, sir. Uh, we stood up a wargaming effort a few years ago, uh, another professor and I, and I can't thank you enough for the help that you provided to us in those early months uh, with a particular game and uh, we hope that we're training them now in order to be better prepared for when they arrive uh, at your shop. So thank you very much. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, some things that are happening on the ocean that aren't necessarily great power competition, but as you'll see by the end, I will argue that, that they are. Um, I'm going to start with the discussion about piracy, Somali piracy, which uh, really reared its head in uh, the late 2000, uh, 2005, 2006 timeframe. Uh, the first tanker was taken by Somali pirates in March, April of, of 2005. Uh, several ships were off of Somalia, including mine at the time. And uh, I started following the issue back then. And as the, the attacks started coming up, 2006, 2007, 2008, uh, we started to see them expand uh, throughout the Gulf of Aden, on this, like on this slide, uh, as well as the Indian Ocean, things that I was told by some of the experts that could never happen, that they would never operate more than 20 miles offshore, they would never attack a larger ship, all these nevers that in uh, all of our PME classes uh, and intelligence classes were told to avoid. And what ends up happening is the shipping companies were, uh, were had no effort, uh, had no ability to protect themselves initially, they weren't interested initially. Primarily because they were just paying the ransoms. They were cheap enough. They were two, three hundred thousand dollars. And uh, as one industry 
vice president told me that was really a drop in the bucket for a day in the life of their their company. Uh, but once the ship started getting ransom for a million dollars, two million, and I think the the high one was twenty million at one point. Uh, the shipping companies uh, went to states and asked for protection. And at that time, we're told, well, sorry, we've got other duties. You guys are on your own at this point. And so they began to hire private private guards on their ships. Uh, they there was some hesitancy at first. Uh, some of the shipping companies, in fact, when I wrote an article uh, for Orbis in 2007, uh, it was based on a Naval War College paper I had written. The professor. Uh, and this shows the, the importance, I think, of professors encouraging uh, new ideas. Professor encouraged me to expand the idea. I then uh, had a colleague, Robert Kaplan, who's written a number of books. And Bob had suggested after reading it, he says, no, you've, not, you've got to double the size of this and really explore it and, and go to an article length. So I wrote an article for Orbis called Black Waters for the Blue Waters. That was not my title. That was the title given by the editor. And uh, the, the theory I had was, as uh, the private security companies we were seeing in Iraq and Afghanistan would eventually uh, diminish in their, in their role and number, and if Somali piracy continued to expand, my article suggested that what we're going to see is private, securities, private security companies going to sea. Uh, and that's what happened. Uh, they started with just the private guards on board their ship, usually uh, teams of three, uh, sometimes two, uh, two teams. Uh, but eventually, uh, they there were companies that said we can we can do it one better. Uh, a few months after my article came out, I was called uh, by I received a call from the CFO of Blackwater. Uh, he and I had met before when I worked on Capitol Hill. One of the, one of the times I was up there. And uh, he said, you know, uh, we read your article. We're really interested in, you know, uh, how you propose this might be done, some of the challenges of something. Uh, are you aware that we have a ship? And at that time I was not. So they invited me down and they bought a, an old NOAA uh, ship, the MacArthur. Uh, over time, they changed the paint scheme it, in it to have a black hull with the word security to make sure that uh, people knew what it was. The intent, uh, as, I, I, as I had suggested in the article, was that these ships would uh, serve as convoy duty, not to attack pirates, uh, Somali pirates, but rather to protect a column of ships. Uh, I did go down to uh, meet with Eric Prince. I interviewed him. That interview I ended up transcribing and putting up on Simsec site, site several years ago. Uh, and what happens is a number of companies start emerging in that 2008-2010 timeframe. Uh, it was almost like the field of dreams. You know, if we build it, they will come. That wasn't quite the case. Several companies had contracts. Some did not. Some ho some some simply hoped for them. Uh, but we it, it didn't really uh, expand beyond that. Uh, I was supposed to be on Blackwater ship. In fact, in uh, February of 2009, uh, when it went to uh, the Gulf of Aden, and uh, I happy to talk about that during the Q&A period, uh, uh, but that was about the period a couple months later when the Maersk Alabama was taken, and I, when I was planning this trip, I actually had a one-third chance of being on the Maersk Alabama uh, at that time. So as piracy again diminishes, there's no need for these uh, security ships, and uh, even the role of private armed guards has, has tremendously diminished over time. But it's always interesting to see this vacuum in security on the high seas as it might happen on land. Now we're all familiar with this iconic, one of these iconic images of uh, ships at sea. This is the next part and what I saw as evolving after the private security companies. Now I know we, we might chuckle at uh, the thought of Sea Shepherd, an environmental organization uh, using this, but they are very publicity savvy. Uh, the term the ship is the visual isn't actually from them. I had interviewed uh, Dr. Rebecca Gomberts, who had been with Greenpeace, and she founded her own organization about this time. It was called, it's called Women on Waves, and what they do is, at least in the past, they would get a ship, and they would go to certain countries which had uh, restrictions on abortion, and they would provide abortion services off the coast. And I asked her, well, why don't you just go to the next country over along the border? And she said, because then we wouldn't get any uh, visibility. The ship is the visual. And I think uh, she was very correct in that, and there are some interesting tactics that her 
her uh, organization used uh, with regard to the Moroccans and the, and the Portuguese especially. So what is Sea Shepherd? Uh, for those of you who may have seen Animal Planet, you will you might think they're pirates. I, I certainly uh, have seen them in a variety of ways. Are they terrorists? Are they some sort of modified private maritime security company? Are they environmental activists? Uh, a few years ago, Naval War College asked me to write a case study for their courses, specifically on Sea Shepherd. So I did a deep dive on them. And it's a, a far more complex organization than we might have seen on television. Uh, first of all, they have ships, not just one or two. They have a number of ships. Some of these no longer exist. Uh, the uh, Bridget Bardot, they sold off. The Addy Gill was sunk after they tried to, to I believe, ram a, a Japanese whaling ship in the Southern Ocean. Uh, but they still maintain about 12 ships. Uh, they continue to modify. They continue to evolve every year. In this case, they purchased three former island class cutters from the United States Coast Guard. I understand they bought a fourth, but by that time the laws has, had changed and they had to uh, only cannibalize, they could only cannibalize it. What's interesting, however, is uh, they can't really be seen as pirates because they are, they have state legitimacy in a number of ways. They fly uh, standard state flags. In this case, they uh, won a, the Dutch postcode lottery which provides money to environmental organizations by and large. And they had enough money to build this ship from the keel up. Ocean Warrior was, uh, some of you may be familiar with this. This is a Dahman class, sorry, a Dahman built uh, ship. They uh, build a lot of models like this. So what does this fleet really look like? And I again, apologize that these uh, slides are probably about a year and a half uh, out of date uh, with starting classes. I wasn't able to uh, get their full uh, uh, scope at this point. Uh, but you can see that these are uh, about half of them are ocean going ships, and that's going to play a role in a few minutes. Um, I also just to give a comparison, took the total uh, gross tonnage of their fleet compared to some state navies, anything that was over 20 gross tons. And again, uh, I, we may chuckle at this, but the fact is none of those countries conduct real blue water operations. They can't operate halfway across, around the world like Sea Shepherd can. Uh, they have certain embedded logistics uh, capabilities that are pretty interesting. Um, just a variety of their campaigns since 1977. They've really expanded when it was founded in the early 70s by Paul Watson. It was primarily to go after uh, seal hunters and then whale uh, hunters uh, or uh, Japanese whaling ships. And so it. Uh, the number of campaigns has increased over time, especially after Whale Wars, the television show, which really gave them far more visibility. And there's a real huge spike in the number of stories about them and how they were able to raise money. Uh, their ships have uh, changed over time. Uh, they've gone more toward a model of either new builds or purchasing uh, some of the older U.S. Uh, some of the some of the U.S. and other uh, nation national ships non-Navy, and their fleet size has increased. Uh, they've been able to conduct operations around the world. Uh, I think the changing point that I argued in, in uh, the Naval War College case study, uh, which I'll provide a link to uh, to, uh, to the major, uh, is that center photo. That is the Thunder. It was an illegal fishing ship, and uh, Peter Hammerstadt is one of the captains of Sea Shepherd, uh, very prominent on uh, on Whale Wars. And he was able to chase this ship 10,000 nautical miles over a 110 day period. During that time, he coordinated with, I believe, 12 or 13 different countries, some quietly, some not so quietly, until finally the ship was scuttled uh, off of Sao Tome. And when that was done, uh, his boarding parties were able to gather enough evidence uh, video photographic uh, material to uh, conduct criminal uh, or provide it to for criminal investigation uh, and the judicial system afterward. Now, I think it's important to note what has changed in the past year is that there's been a uh, very visible, very public uh, schism within Sea Shepherd. Paul Watson, the founder on the upper left, uh, is no longer with Sea Shepherd. Uh, the organization is now uh, uh, 
uh, managed by a new generation, which has a different view. Paul Watson has continued now with his own organization, the Captain Paul Watson Foundation. He now has a new ship. And what they have done now is gone to Iceland uh, on regarding, I believe, the minke whales. And uh, he's going to continue the same kind of uh, very high publicity kinetic actions that he was known for in the 70s. By contrast, however, uh, Peter Hammerstadt and uh, the, I will call them the new Sea Shepherd, uh, because it truly is a new era. They are no longer operating independently. They are operating with under memorandums of agreement with nations, uh, several West African nations, uh, one uh, nation on the East Coast. They have worked with Mexico. And what's interesting is, for those countries that I, I showed you before that don't have navies, that don't have the maritime capacity that may, we might hope for in our partners, no matter where they are uh, or the size of their nation, uh, what, they, what the new Sea Shepherd provides is a platform, a ship, the fuel, a crew that is primarily volunteer, except a few, maybe like the engineer, the captain, uh, first mate, uh, maybe a couple of others. Uh, and then what they do is they will assume uh, they will, sorry, they will uh, get the other country that they are partnered with to assume authority for the illegal fishing mission in terms of patrols and arrests. They will have armed uh, folks aboard who are from that country, from the host country. Those may be uh, Coast Guard, they may be their Marines, uh, may be other kinds of uh, fisheries enforcement officers. It depends on the country. This system has worked extremely well uh, for Sea Shepherd. I think they're closing in on about 100 illegal fishing trawlers that they have either deterred, arrested, uh, or otherwise seized uh, alongside uh, the host nations. Now, uh, the people themselves are important uh, in any organization, but I started talking to Sea Shepherd uh, about, probably about 10 years ago. If any of you have seen it, Whale Wars, uh, the one of the characters on the second season, Jane Taylor, was actually a Naval Academy graduate, class of 2002. She became a SWO uh, from all reports of, from friends of mine. She was a fantastic SWO, but after her five years was up, she resigned her commission uh, following the completion of her duties and went to serve on a Sea Shepherd ship for a while. Uh, the gentleman who is operating a small boat over here uh, with the helmet and the lower photo, uh, he is a retired admiral from the Italian Navy. In fact, he was the chief of staff of the Italian Navy. And I believe he started off as a bosun's mate, and he has since uh, commanded a couple of his ships. So they have uh, prior military. They have prior uh, police. They have prior uh, environmentalists. It's, an, it's a very interesting mix of their crews. Now, uh, what I argued initially with private security companies at sea, and I would argue that this presents an opportunity for the United States and its partners, is this public-private maritime uh, partnership relationship with organizations like this. Why? Uh, namely because the United States Navy doesn't have uh, enough ships to go where it needs to, or to, and again, my opinion, my opinion only, um, or to a lot of the places that we probably should go to. There are a lot of smaller countries, a lot of smaller harbors where we might pull in for a couple of days. And I spoke to a minister from one of the West African countries a couple of years ago, when I, or a few years ago now, when I was doing the, the study for War College. And they said, you know, it's great that you bring in one of your big gray ships to our port, but you're in for a couple of days, you visit, you give us a coffee mug, and then you're gone. Sea Shepherd comes in for a month to three months while the fish are there and while the illegal fishing vessels are there, and they, they've been providing a lot of support. So uh, I think this presents an interesting potential model for, uh, for the United States or some of its partners, as some of these countries have done. The way you need to do it, however, is not the Iraq or Afghanistan model. You need to be able to incorporate them into your planning uh, to regulate the companies themselves, to ensure they are properly vetted, and coordinate their activities. Now, is this gonna happen? I, I honestly don't think so, uh, but I think the fact that they are already working with a number of countries uh, with whom we have significant diplomatic relations is important. The last few slides before I hand it over uh, to the major for some of his questions and discussion, why is this important in terms of uh, 
great power competition, specifically with the United States and China. This is from 1950, all of the fish, all the fishing by fleets of China in 1950. So as you can tell from this, it is primarily uh, in the South China Sea. But, and I won't bore you with all the uh, decade by decade approaches, but this is what it looked like just 13 years ago. And I'm, I can tell you right now that uh, the 2023 uh, slide is, is no better. The Chinese are operating their fishing fleets there around the world. We are starting to see more and more uh, uh, articles uh, and coverage of this issue. And uh, there is concern. Uh, because I think as, as a history professor, one of the things I go over with midshipmen is, is the history of great power competitions. And uh, normally where the merchant fleets go, and as they arise in numbers, you're going to naturally have a Navy that follows it. I think this presents uh, incredible uh, challenges uh, for us and potential flashpoints where we might, nor nor excuse me, we might not normally expect it. And finally, uh, I think it, it also presents a very interesting intersection of interests uh, with regard to the United States. Right now, our, our primary concern is China uh, with developing maritime states and our partners. It's uh, ensuring economic stability and certainly fishing, which is uh, depleting at a rapid rate is becoming more problematic. I think that's why the Pew Charitable Trust recently created a new game with uh, uh, Sebastian Bay, with whom you all may be familiar, Sebastian uh, helped us out incredibly with our wargaming effort as well. But they've got a war game so they can teach policymakers and other stakeholders about the problems of illegal fishing. Uh, and then finally, Sea Shepherd, which uh, you know they've been founded and they've uh, completely been uh, uh, consistent with concern about depletion of marine life, but they are now focusing not on. Uh, the elimination of all fishing, but the elimination of illegal fishing fleets. So I think there's this, a very interesting intersection in this this diagram. So with that, uh, Major, I'll turn it over to you, and that's uh, that's just a brief introduction to the two primary uh, issues that I've been tracking for uh, maritime security outside of uh, states for the past 15 years. I really appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I thought I talked or I thought about when I was reading through the uh, the articles, um, one of them was, you know, the what is it, the the, the anecdote that people always say, like a, a boat is a hole in the water that you throw money into. Uh, and so I was wondering, you know, how is it that a company like Blackwater, uh, or you know, they're not Blackwater anymore, but right. as Blackwater, you know, they seem to to not succeed at this idea of a maritime uh security company but some uh you know an organization like sea shepherd uh is and not only is able to be successful but you know grow uh over time you know i think some of that was a little bit due to, to whale wars and kind of that popularity and sort of not necessarily a a change in their mission but a change in how they went about doing it yeah. um so i guess that would be my opening question is you know why does some succeed and some fail in this in this realm so it's interesting because when I interviewed Prince on the MacArthur, and I remember the day, it was uh, the day that President Obama was inaugurated in 2009. Uh, he said that the the real long-term plan uh, was not to protect ships from pirates. He said what he wanted to do was migrate the idea to illegal fishing, where they would work on behalf of a country that did not have a uh, a, a fleet, uh, whether that be Navy or Coast Guard, in order to interdict ships, and then they would get paid that way. Uh, they never got a client, by the way. Uh, they were supposed to go to Djibouti, where they were supposed to pick up clients, but they never did. Uh, the, I think the primary reason is cost. Uh, first of all, the, the Sea Shepherd, their crew is primarily voluntary. They go in for three to four months for a campaign. A number of them do multiple campaigns, but usually that means three months out of the year, and then they go back to whatever job they had in Europe or uh, Central America, wherever uh, they happen to be from, the United States. So when you're looking at, at cost alone, whether it's the United States Navy, where a significant portion of, of our budget is personnel related, Sea Shepherd doesn't have to worry about that. They also don't have to worry about certain regulations. For example, when they pull into a port, and uh, Peter Hammerstadt was telling me about this, uh, they're, they're a vegan crew. 
they don't have to worry about uh, meat and dairy products, which are subject to regulation. So they can pop in and pop out of a port without uh, having to engage with those inspections. They've also started looking at uh, a at their food supply while on long term missions. And he learned that during that 110 day period, he realized that they had enough, you know, rice, beans, uh, you know, the fresh food would go away pretty quickly. Uh, but that they could potentially grow uh, items, uh, whether um, it's called uh, microgreens or other things on the ship if they establish hydroponic gardens. And I thought it was interesting because not too long after that, there was an experiment on one of our submarines to provide fresh uh, vegetables as well. Uh, I forget which ship that uh, what submarine that was on. Uh, so they have some interesting ways of doing things. They uh, so Sea Shepherd is is different in terms of their funding because they rely heavily on donations, and they operate it within that. I think uh, on average they they operate on a budget of about 15 million a year. Uh, so you have some high high level donors and then a lot of small donors, much like political campaigns. Whereas uh, the uh, Blackwater and its other uh, competitors were simply going on margin. They were trying to find out how much money could we get paid for by the shipping companies. I think only in one case were they getting paid by a, a country, and it wasn't Blackwater. It was uh, another smaller company uh, for one convoy duty. Yeah, I think that kind of feeds into my next question. And you talked about it in the uh, the Blackwater uh, Blue Water article. You know, you had th sort of three options. You know, talking about uh, you know it, the article opens with talking about Admiral Mullen saying, "Hey, we need a, a thousand ship navy." You know, and and he, at the time he wasn't necessarily talking about an actual physical thousand fleet navy. He was talking about, "Hey, you know, we can get rid of minesweepers." If somebody else has minesweepers, right? And so this idea of being able to join up with private maritime security companies and NGOs to be able to, you know, flesh out this this thousand ship navy, uh, you know, you talked about, hey, and you talked about it a little bit uh, earlier, saying, hey, you know, you've got folks that, you know, we've spent a lot of time and money training pilots for both the navy and the marine corps. We spent a lot of time training uh, surface warfare officers, especially very experienced ones that might have been department heads as well. You know, when they depart the service, you know, have we really got out of that person kind of the money, the time investment that we put into them? And if they go to these private security companies, you know, we kind of get the benefit if we're able to work with them. Um, I once sat in, in a meeting with uh, a wing CG who had been in another meeting. So, I, you know, in a court of law, this is all circumstantial, but, you know, that the, the general was saying, hey, I was in a meeting with all the CEOs of the major airlines and I asked them, how do I keep pilots uh, in the Marine Corps? How do you know, what can I do to keep them? And, you know, his comment was that, you know, the, the CEOs all looked at him and said, there's nothing you can do. I, we can always offer more money. Uh, so, you know, is there a possibility that, you know, going that route, you might see more people I'm going to use the, the, the phrase jump ship, uh, mm -hmm. you know, tongue in cheek, but, you know, is, could it also hurt us if we're, you know, suggesting that folks can do that as well to fill out these companies? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote an article for War on the Rocks called All Sane Men Believe in Re Reserves, and, in which I argued that the United States Navy uh, Reserve specifically has lost uh, a lot of its culture over the past 20 years from the land wars. Uh, you know, I think all of us were were deployed at some point. I don't I don't think uh, or I can't I can think of very few Navy reservists who weren't deployed at some point, um, at least once. Uh, but I found, especially when I was in Guantanamo Bay, as some of the U.S. Navy ships were passing through, I had served on a ship, fortunately. So I was able to uh, talk with uh, the ships that were coming through and get tours, at least, to get our, our Navy reservists familiar with what is a ship. Uh, some of these folks had never seen a ship, uh, literally have never been inside a ship before. So I did a lot of familiarization for them. What I think we might be able to do is use the reserves better. Uh, pro maybe provide some partnering programs with whether it's Sea Shepherd or we, the United States or one of the other countries creates a similar organization where some of our folks could actually serve, go do their two weeks or do, uh, you know, uh, nine, 90 days on one of the campaigns to get sea experience. And I have to tell you that these, uh, these folks, Peter Hammerstadt is uh, no kidding Mariner. Uh, what he's done with some of his ships is, is really incredible and, uh, 
you know, honest, uh, honest, uh, goodness, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd probably, I'd feel co very comfortable serving on his ship. He's no pirate. He's not irresponsible. And, uh, I tend to think that some of the other captains that I've, I've, uh, spoken to and interviewed are the same way. Uh, but that might present an opportunity. So, uh, in case, uh, in the cases of working with these partner nations, these partners would know, wait a minute, there are also us Navy reservists here. And that's, that's, uh, uh, that's a uniform that they'd like to see too, the general United States military uniform uh, that is supporting those efforts. Or those skill sets can then later be used if we ever decide to uh, start building up smaller ships, for example, like we used to, um, then that skill set would be good as well. But I think that would be beneficial for the Navy Reserve at this point. We've we've really lost a lot, uh, in my opinion. We, we certainly had to, uh, you know, uh, Go to Iraq, Afghanistan for those IA missions, but uh, those were missions for which the the training wasn't there. Uh, the training was for more maritime operations. So I think it this now that we're out of both of those countries, this may be a great opportunity to rejuvenate the Navy Reserve with the uh, mission for which it was intended a century ago. Again, my uh, I'll I'll. Views are my own and not those of the United States Navy or U.S. government. Sir, so I think uh, I've got one more question and then we'll lead into it because we've got a, had a couple uh, put here in the chat. So I'm going to pull uh, one more option that you wrote about in your black water, blue water, and it's probably my favorite of the three options. Uh, and that was bringing up the, uh, the letters of Mark. Um, and I'm going to couple that with, you know, you had the conversations about having uh, enforcement uh, folks from you know, individual countries. I'm assuming that's for uh, enforcement of the laws within the national waters for whatever country that is. But, you know, you know, we'll bring in letters of Mark, but what's the legality of doing, you know, kind of these stoppings, but in international waters? Yeah, that uh, unfortunately, there was a segment that inadvertently was omitted from the end of that article in which I discussed the Hague Convention and uh, we don't have letters of mark anymore. Nobody, except in my second novel, that's the only time that I use it. Uh, but in reality, we have been subject to the Hague Convention for more than a century. I think it was uh, 1907. So we have not used letters of mark and reprisal, and we can't. It's not something that would be realistically done today. What I did say in a follow-on article in order to try to correct that uh, unfortunate omission was a piece I had in another magazine called Contracts of Mark that would work sort of like Letters of Mark, but we already had contracts that were being issued by the United States government to private security companies at that time in 2007, 2008. And uh, I argued that what we could do is just modify the law at that point to uh, provide con to provide that uh, to uh, potential vendors. And again, very important. You've, if we were ever to do this, we have to go back to those three words I used, co integrate, coordinate, and most importantly, regulate. Uh, the most important part of it is, is the vetting process. Yeah, I think with that regulation piece, we kind of saw that and, with the land-based. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead, sir. And I should say, I apologize. I want to say it's why I argued that it was extremely important that the United States do this, because if we didn't, as in any vacuum we saw with piracy, another state might do it. And what we ended up seeing was China ended up having a, a very significant relationship with the follow on to Blackwater uh, with Eric Prince, in which he was working with a number of uh, senior uh, Chinese uh, business officials in East Africa, providing uh, some logistic support. So that's why I say, you know, if we, uh, you know, sort of give the Heisman to a concept like this, we have to understand, is somebody else going to pick up that football and use it against us? Yeah, and I was just adding the point that, you know, we, uh, you know, kind of did some regulation a little bit with Blackwater saying, hey, if you're a contractor, you're in a combat zone and we're contracting with you, you are, uh, you know, bound to the UCMJ. Um, but that wasn't until a couple of years after, you know, our initial use of, you know, folks like Blackwater. But that wouldn't be unprecedented. For example, uh, with the letters of Mark and the privateers in the early 1800s, uh, they were subject to what was then the, our version of the UCMJ, the Ar Act Governing the Articles of uh, the Navy of War in the Navy. Uh, sorry, as a history professor, I should have this off the top of my head. Uh, but there were uh, cases where they were court-martialed, privateers were court-martialed, uh, 
In the 1830s, there were a number of efforts uh, to legislate the uh, benefits package or pension for privateers as well. So even early on in our, even again, even though we don't use privateers anymore, there's some sort of precedent for integrating these forces and ensuring the legalities. So we're going to kick it over to the chat and we'll start asking some of their questions as well. So you brought up uh, Somalia. And so the question was, is uh, wouldn't it be more cost effective to go toward the source uh, where pirates birth their vessels? I think there's some obvious answers, but just, you know, why would we go this route as opposed to that route? There was, and I've been debating whether or not to write an article on this. There was uh something about this in 2005 we were looking at. Uh, one of the problems is that, it, and again, Somali piracy is not an issue right now. Uh, it has largely abated. Uh, very rare are there any attacks right now. It's been years uh, since, I think, any, the last one, maybe one or two. Uh, but even at the height of Somali piracy, the problem was uh, the integration of the pirates with the population. Uh, who were who are you going to go after? Are you going to go after? Uh, are you sure this is the fishing vessel that was used for pirate action? Are you sure that uh, the this family in particular? So, there was a. Uh, it wasn't like there were pirate bases, if you will. It was a, an entire community, and so you have to look at the rules of the the rules of war, uh, and be extremely careful and judicious in in how you go after these. Uh, because they were selling shares of, I remember in one case, uh, uh, a lady came in and said, you know, this is our, our family's uh, RPG or something. And uh, we, she donated the RPG and in order, and then she got a share of the profit of whatever ship might be captured uh, for ransom. So I think that's the difficulty uh, primarily in trying to go after uh, some folks in Somalia. I know we're really good at targeting. Uh, we try to minimize any collateral uh, damage, but in that case, uh, you know, there, there are no pirate uniforms. There are no uh, specific pirate ships. They can shift uh, anywhere they want. Uh, the technology is really minimal. I used to do boardings in the uh, Arabian Sea and in the Indian Ocean. And I can tell you, uh, aside from the engine and maybe a radio, uh, they didn't even have a refrigerator on board. You know, you'd normally see, you know, uh, fetid onions and garlic and, and tomatoes and fish strewn about. Uh, so, there's uh, some targeting limitations on on something like this. Uh, and then going back, and I think this kind of stemmed from your uh, discussion about you know potentially what the the Navy Reserve could be doing. What can uh, you know as the Marine Corps kind of shifts its focus to the Pacific and looking more at the littorals and how do we control key terrain uh, in the Pacific and the first island chain? You know, what can the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps and probably down to the fleets as well, you know, what can we do now to kind of contribute more to this, to the challenge, you know, specifically working with NGOs uh, and these private security companies? So I, I don't know if I'd necessarily go straight to the private security companies, because I don't know if there are actually any remaining with ships. Um, we might be able to. Uh, create a broad agency announcement uh, BAA uh, and see what we might be able to to see out there. But I, I would probably start off with an organization like Sea Shepherd only because they have uh, the exper uh, the expertise in many of these countries and places that we wouldn't. They understand fish patterns, you know, fish don't always stay in the same place. If you're, if you fish that, you know, you've got to go certain times a year, certain times a day, whatever. Uh, so they know where the illegal fishing trawlers are likely to be. They have embedded understanding of the ocean that I would argue that the Navy doesn't have uh, and uh, even sometimes the Coast Guard doesn't have depending on what part of the world. I think people are our best resource and uh, you know if we don't have the platforms uh, to support an effort like this then uh, the next step is to get some of our folks aboard and coordinate and see if we can coordinate. It'd be great to see a pilot program uh, maybe uh, Sea Shepherd if they had a uh, campaign coming up and they said, yeah, we'd be willing to do an MOU. Uh, I think that kind of holistic approach of, of uh, not only NGOs, the partner, the host nation and U.S. personnel uh, would be uh, an interesting and potential deterrent to a lot of these illegal fishers. Again, uh, the percentage of fish that have come out of the water uh, and the uh, number due to illegal fishing vessels 
is rising every year. I can I'll get you the numbers that I that I had pulled for some of my studies. But uh, when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, you know the baseline is food, water, shelter, air, and uh, as fish deplete, I think that we're we're going to start to see more competition for the that very strategic resource of the 21st century in a way that we may have seen uh, oil for the 20th century. And in a, in a far more desperate manner, I would add, I would add. And again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I only learned really more about some of these issues uh, later in life, but uh, from an uh, analytical standpoint uh, and the, and seeing the trends that I've been seeing, I'd, I'd say that's, that's where we're going. And my follow on question to that, you know, one of the things I thought about was when it comes to NGOs, like we're very, I don't, I don't want to say verse, but, you know, we've had, we have experience in the past working with, you know, folks like Doctors Without Borders, the Red Cross and other organizations like that. Does the U.S. approach to, you know, folks like Sea Shepherd or other, you know, NGOs uh, that are maritime, does our approach change because they're on the water or does our approach need to remain the same as they would if we were dealing with like the Red Cross or a similar organization? That's a great question. Um, I, I think, uh, no, I think it's the same way. Now, I think in Sea Shepherd's case, people are starting to see more and more that the organization has changed and that the more kinetic approach that they founded in the 70s and 80s is, is much more isolated, that they're, the new Sea Shepherd is far more willing to work with host nations to do things right kind of the thoughts that come to your head when you think of it, because, you know, before we had started having the conversation, you know, I had no idea that Blackwater had a maritime component, even if it was for a short time. And I honestly had not thought about Sea Shepherd or, or even that it was still an organization since the time on, on Whale Wars and Animal Planet. So, you know, knowing that organizations like that are not only still there, but, you know, thriving well beyond what they were, you know, even during the Animal Planet series. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's, something that I just never really thought of. And so that's definitely why we, I asked you to come and, and talk about that, you know, based on all the other topics that you kind of put out there. Um, you had mentioned in a different video that you did about a, two months ago, I think that uh, Peter Hammerstead actually came to the Naval Academy, I believe, and spoke to the yeah. midshipmen. Uh, what kind of conversation was he having uh, with the mids? Was that a Forrestal lecture or? No, uh, that was, uh, I had a lecture series here at the museum and uh, I invited Peter, and I couldn't believe actually that he that he uh, came over here. Uh, we had lunch, uh, we talked, and then he talked to them about the chase of the thunder. Uh, I thought it might be of interest, and what really struck me was afterward. We did uh, a Q and A that was off the uh, off the record. We didn't video uh, uh, that portion of it, but it was interesting that several midshipman afterwards said, you know, I, I was planning on going slow and I still do. But after that, I would love to work for an organization like yours. And I, I'm watching this like one after another. I just couldn't believe it. Um, so that, yeah, it was fo primarily focused on the thunder and how that, again, I, I really think that was the new evolution of Sea Shepherd. That was the driving event. In fact, uh, the chase of the thunder and the results is what caused a, uh, another West African country to contact Sea Shepherd for their first partnership. So a very a significant uh, period. Sure. And I think that, you know, we could kind of feed that in. You, you, you said to bring up the, uh, you know, your possibility of being on the, the Maersk, to leave that for the, the Q&A, the, the Maersk, Alabama. If yep. You wanted to share that story. Uh, so I, uh, I was teaching as an adjunct at that point at the academy. Uh, and when I, I interviewed Eric Prince the, uh, for two hours on the MacArthur. At the end of it, I he said to you, you have any more questions? I said, yeah, one more. Can I go with you guys on this mission? And he said, I, do you want to come with our company? I said, no, no, no. I want to go as an embedded journalist. And I will say to his credit, without missing a beat, he turned to his maritime security operations director, uh, Tom, and said, Tom, do you think we can get him a stateroom? And Tom said, no problem. We'll get one ready. So I was supposed to meet them in Djibouti uh, after they did kind of a shakedown on, in the Atlantic. The uh, and what I wanted to do was a series of articles and then do a book. I went to the Washington Times. Uh, Rich Minniter was the managing editor at the time, and he hired me as uh, as a special correspondent. So I'd have the credentials throughout the Middle East, wherever I wanted to go. I met with uh, the defense attache from Yemen at the time. 
and, uh, Soleil, who was uh, he was the nephew of the president at the time. Uh, Richard introduced us, and so uh, I was I thought, okay, I, I have the Navy experience of having been off Somalia. I, I'll be getting the Blackwater experience and studying them, but I really like to know more about the merchant service. So I went to the uh, to Maersk. And uh, talked to a guy I knew who was the vice president over there. I said, "Hey, um, here's here's what I'm asking. Can I, you know, kind of jump on one of your ships as a supernumerary? Uh, I'd like to go take a trip over to Djibouti, meet the ship. I'll be on Blackwater ship for about six weeks, and then I'd really like to get back in time for uh, graduation. My first uh, class of midshipmen who I'd come in with as plebes were graduating. I really wanted to be there. So he said, "Yeah, no problem. We've we've got three options for you to take a Maersk ship back." And he it was like the Maersk Arizona, the Maersk something else, and the Maersk Alabama. And I said, "Tell you what, I'll uh, I'll wait till I get out there." Now the funny part about this is that the night before I was supposed to leave, I was out uh, for cigars and steak with Rich Miniter, and I said, "You know, Rich, I've never been a reporter before. Uh, wh what should I expect? Uh, what's the best case scenario?" And with a big cigar, he just says, uh, "You know, Claude, the best case scenario is that uh, Somali pirates capture the ship you're on, but." They let you live so you could write about it for us. So that was that was my almost. So uh, I did not go out uh, because at the very literally the morning I was supposed to leave, uh, Blackwater contacted me from Aqaba. They never made it to Djibouti. They told me at that point, sorry, we don't have any clients. We thought we were going to have them, and so I called Rich. I said, do I have a story? He said, no, do you you know you don't have the story as a result. So we decided to call off the the thing, and I came back to the academy. So I, and I think. Uh... That's kind of, you know, I could have, could have been, would have been, you know, what would have happened had I been there? It would have been interesting. Could have been a character in a movie though. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I've heard you use the term uh, sea blindness before. And I think as we talk about, you know, you know, me saying, Hey, I've never even heard of some of these, you know, organizations or, you know, that this is a thing that we should think about, not necessarily worry about, but certainly think about, you know, what is sea blindness? Because I think that might be an important thing to share. Something I tell my midshipmen, in fact, I just uh, went over this today in class with them. When you think about the 1820s in the United States, uh, we had the world's largest whaling fleet. What that meant is we had people who were building ships in a lot of cities. We had people who were crewing those vessels. We had people who were commanding them. We had people who were tangentially uh, related financially, whether they were providing uh, food, supplies, what have you, or were benefiting from the product. And we had a growing Navy. People understood the sea, I think, from a public standpoint, a lot better because they had a natural interest in it. The same way I would argue in World War II because of the industrial base, a lot of shipyards from around the country. Uh, but even in my home state of Maine, which has Bath Iron Works, I grew up not too far from there, uh, even today, people aren't that familiar with the Navy. Uh, it, one of my midshipmen said, yeah, I was just out in town uh, and somebody from Annapolis said, what are you? Are you cadets? Are you military? What are you? And they, they'd been around the, you know, the Annapolis all their lives and they didn't understand what the Navy was. So I think from a broader public standpoint, uh, there is um, a blindness in terms of that we actually do these things at sea or that all of these items that they see at uh, your general store, uh, large store, come from China or elsewhere via ships. Uh, I don't know if we've articulated that well enough. I know there are a couple of folks like uh, Jerry Hendricks and Brian McGrath uh, who probably are the best uh, in articulating why we need a Navy and how important it is. But by the same token, I don't think people have enough skin in the game as they did 150 or 200 years ago to at least have some semblance of the relationship to the sea. And I think that has then resulted in uh, a dispassionate view of the Navy. In fact, when you look at polling for the past 20 or 30 years about what the most significant service is, it, it certainly hasn't been the Navy. I think the Navy's hovered around 6 or 7%, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, on the Gallup polls. Uh, normally, it'll be the, the Army and Marine Corps because of the heavy lifting and the significant contributions they made to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but they don't see on a day-to-day -day basis what the Navy does or what it's supposed to do. So I, I think in, in that terms, uh, and I'm, I, I certainly didn't come up with the term sea blindness. That's a, it's a far more common than uh, I could claim uh, for. So. 
Does that include the, the Coast Guard as well? Because I feel like, you know, depending if you live on the coast, you're probably going to hear about the Coast Guard more, you know, based on rescues and different things. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. I think they, because of the variety of their missions and what, what they do for the amount of money they get is incredible. Uh, we had, we had a coast guard ship with my strike group, uh, and just watching them operate was, was truly incredible, uh, on the variety of missions and, and the skill sets they brought. So, yeah, I think uh, people may be more familiar with the coast guard just because they're, they're closer to home. And, you know, when we go, uh, the Navy ships go overseas, you really don't see what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I, you know, my, I think what might be the, the last question kind of going to plug a little bit of one of the videos that you had recently on the, uh, the Naval Academy Museum uh, YouTube channel, you talked about, uh, you, you were talking about the Starfleet's uh, museum in one of the episodes of Picard, but one of the things you said in the episode kind of struck me a little bit. You were talking about the National Museum of the Marine Corps, the National Museum of the Army, and the Navy's museum, and how they are close to, uh, you know, our major political hub in Washington, DC, you know, and it's near the policymakers. You know, in that episode, you talked about, hey, you know, it's important that the fact that the Starfleet's museum is nowhere close to Earth or San Francisco. It's somewhere completely different because it serves a different purpose. So you, you talked about sea blindness and people's, uh, you know, we aren't paying attention to the sea the same amount. You know, is there some way what what would be the way to kind of get people to start thinking about the sea again? You know, would it be museums like we have or? You know, I'll, I gave a speech uh, to the Naval Order of the United States last fall. And even though I'm a director of a museum, Navy, in fact, this is the oldest Navy museum in the country. Uh, I don't know if even the, the folks who are graduates from here are aware of that, but we've had some sort of museum since 1845. Um, I... I'll use, an, I'll use an experience I had up in Canada uh, about 15 years ago. I was uh, in this convent chapel. There were voices singing. There were pews. There was an altar. I'm, ca I'm Catholic, by the way. I'm not, not a great Catholic, I'm just Catholic. Uh, and what struck me is that this whole chapel had been taken out of the original convent, and it was now in the National Museum of Ottawa, uh, uh, the, their National Museum. And I, it struck me that... It's a largely secular uh, country now. Uh, a lot of their Catholic churches have closed, but they had something in a museum. And when I was talking to the Naval Order of the United States, I said, I, I fear that even though I think it's a great idea that we have a national museum, I fear that we're going to have the same result. In fact, in Canada at that time, they were selling, uh, if, if you're Catholic, you, you have these hosts that you uh, communion. They were selling them as candy. Uh, at the time in Quebec. So it'd become a very secular uh, item to have. My fear is that we may build a museum, but it may not necessarily translate into a greater public awareness of what we are doing today and the future. We are continuing to look at the past and what we have done and not what we need to do. So that's not my role to do, I, I don't think, but uh, that's my two cents. And by no, the way, for the uh, Mr. Driscoll, who said clear shipping lanes of international waters, I, I, that's absolutely correct. Uh, protect commerce. That is in our interest. I absolutely agree. I think you're absolutely right. You know, we're still looking at what we've done in the past. Uh, and I guess it wouldn't really answer the question of what are we doing? You know, what are you doing for me now? You know, might contribute a lot to that. Not yeah. a, a misunderstanding of what what we do. We only have a few minutes left in the hour, so I want to just kind of leave it up to you, sir, for kind of closing comments. If you want to plug anything, you know, podcasts sure. and books, uh, you know, go for it. And we'll close it out, sir. Yeah, actually, if you can see uh, over my left shoulder, you'll see the podcast. That is the Preble Hall Naval History Podcast that I started four years ago. I'm very fortunate to have now in the past year several co-hosts that helped me out. And we've just done a big series with Admiral Mullen. Uh, we and uh, interviewed a number of Marines. The command, the general who was in command of Sea Signal, was awesome. Um, my latest novel is uh, the Philippine Pact. Uh, came out in April. It's part of the Connor Stark series. It's the third novel. It takes place in the South China Sea, and it's a private security company at sea. So basically, I took what I was studying in the real world and applied it to these novels. And my next book is on Rickover. Uh, Rickover Uncensored. It should be out in the next month. Rick over and censored. Uh, I chose not to do a biography, but his w late wife, uh, Eleanor, whose uh, interment I attended a couple of weeks ago at Arlington National Cemetery, had donated an 
a lot and the biggest collection of Rick over papers, about 250 boxes. I went through all of them and I decided to let Rick over speak in his own words. It's about 150,000 from where it's from 1929 until uh, just a few months before his passing transcripts of telephone conversations. He had love letters from the 1930s to his first wife, uh, memoranda for the record, uh, even transcripts of some of the famous interviews. So uh, I, I hope it'll shed some light on, on who Rick over really was. He was a far more complex individual than uh, I think we've, we've grown accustomed to. So that's, uh, that's what I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing with the, with the wider historical and uh, Navy community. I'm sure there's a, a number of submariners out there, especially some of the, the older ones that would be very interested in learning about Rick over, especially the officers that had to, to had to interview with them. So, yeah. uh, Thank you, Dr. Barabee, for your time and your insight. Um, and for me personally, thank you very much for doing this on such, such short notice. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. So uh, thank you to all the folks who joined us today in the chat. Uh, that's all we have for today. So go ahead and uh, carry out the plan of the day. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Krulak community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. Also, if you have enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support, and we'll see you on the next episode. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.